So, uh, but if you are watching online, if you would, if you have an interest, you can type in Acts 27, uh, Paul's journey, and a map will come up, and that will be something that you can help with, uh, help you follow what we're going to do. So, I am going to take just five minutes or so, which I think we will all be thankful for, and remind us where we were. Right. The goal is that this will be two more weeks. Uh, to finish up Acts. In a perfect world, we would have finished it before Lent, but we didn't, and that's okay. Maybe there's a good reason for that. Um, what I am going to ask, if, if there's a certain book of the Bible that you have always wanted to have a study, to text it to me or write me or even talk to me after this or at church, uh, or if you're online, just kind of write it to the church and let us know. Uh, and I will uh, look at different options that we can study. I know uh, I don't know exactly. I have a number of ideas for myself, but I'd like to know what you folks are thinking and what you'd like to learn. Maybe what's that? The Book of Revelation for the rest of the year? Oh, you want to study Lamentations, the most depressing book in the Bible outside of Ecclesiastes. Man, actually, I shouldn't say that. Lamentations is a gorgeous book where Jeremiah laments, but in the end, he trusts that God will one day redeem his people, which leads us to the Messiah. So it actually ends in an awesome note of, of God, and some of those verses are very appropriate for us. All right. So, but in all seriousness, if there's something you've always wanted to study, please talk to me in the next week or so or write me something on your ideas. I can't promise I'll use them, but it may help guide me in what we put together as we finish up these last two chapters of Paul. No, we've, But if we're going to do Lamentations, we might as well do Jeremiah, which is 50-some chapters. So let's just take the rest of the year. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> all right. Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wonderful time of fellowship we've already had, and we ask, Lord, that your word would come alive to us tonight. Across this room and across the, the world, really, Lord, we each are in our different places of victory or wrestling with you, and we ask that what we learn from your, your leading of Paul and Luke and these others in Acts 27, that the right part of Scripture will minister to us tonight to draw us near to you. For you are our God, we pray. Amen. <laughs> Just as a real quick two, three minute reminder. Paul had been taken by the Sanhedrin and gone to Caesarea to go before Felix, the governor at that time. Felix kept him there not knowing what to do with him because Paul seemed to have committed no crimes that were worthy of any kind of persecution or prosecution. And so he didn't know what to do. But eventually, because Felix was only there for a few years, he was yanked out for doing a terrible job and they brought a fellow named Festus in. And so in chapter 25, we read of tr Paul's trial before Festus and that's what we went through. And Festus was so enamored with this man Paul and, and this Christianity and the stuff he was still learning about because he was all of a sudden put over all these people that had these Jews and these Christians and what could you can imagine was a huge uh, challenging situation. And so Festus decides to bring in Agrippa. If you remember, Agrippa, for all intents and purposes, was his boss. He was kind of the next layer up in the, in the, Romans, in the Roman leadership of government. And so he says, Agrippa, as you're coming through, let's listen to this guy, Paul. We don't know what to do with him. And I always found it interesting because Festus said something to the, the, the um, something like, well, Felix left him here, and so I don't know how to deal with it. So he kind of passed the buck a little bit on that. And so Agrippa and Festus and uh, Festus's or Agrippa's wife, Bernice, listened to Paul. And if you remember, Paul stood before them with great boldness and great unction of the Holy Spirit and gave his testimony. And the end result is found in 20, chapter 26, verse 29. Paul replied, or I'm sorry, 28, and Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul replied, short time or long, I pray, God, that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. 
which I think is one of the most beautiful rebuttals to a leader that you could possibly give. Saying, I wish the best for you to know Christ, but not have to go through what I'm going through. It's a tremendous uh, statement of strength and mercy at the same time. And so the king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with him. They left the room, and while talking to one another, this man has done nothing or anything that deserves death or imprisonment. And Agrippa, who remember is the leader of the whole, not just that region, but all the regions around, says this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And so as we move into chapter 27, let me just open with the question. Why do you, th do you think God led Paul to appeal to Caesar? Because when he appealed to Caesar, he was protecting himself against the Sanhedrin coming against him to kill him. So do you think Paul did that just to protect himself? Or do you think God guided him to do that? Because God obviously knew that he could have been let go at this time. What do you think? In the back. So God had a bigger plan than the comfort of Paul, is what you're saying. Which, as we know of Paul, that was no problem for him, right? Mm. No, that, that's really good. That's really good, Paul. Because he, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. No longer I live, but Christ lives. Which means whatever he wants to do with me, he can do with me. So am I hearing across the room, and you're welcome to disagree, but across the room I think I'm hearing that Paul was being led by the Lord to say I appeal to Caesar in order to get to Rome. Shelly. Mm. And a more influential audience, Yes. Wow. So in other words, Paul looked more at the effect of his decision and how it could help others versus his own security. Right? That's a powerful thing for us, isn't it? Because, because of his selflessness, he, he brought the gospel to Agrippa and uh, to uh, Festus. And, to, and we don't know what ended up with these two men. But we know they heard the gospel presented in power um, for their lives. So, okay. Well, let's move on. Does anybody have any questions before we move on to 27? I, I did the short, short version. I hope you appreciate that <laughs> to get us to 27. Now, I'm going to tell you, after all the excitement of these previous chapters, chapter 27, it's a bit like hearing somebody's diary as they walk through the Appalachian Mountains. <laughs> it's a bit dry. It's a bit interesting. There's points of reference. And so my hope is to help us follow along. And you're going to see the map I gave you. And again, if you're watching online, you can type in uh, Acts 27, uh, Voyage of Paul, and you'll come up with a map. And you'll see on your map that we're starting in what's Caesarea, the bottom right-hand corner of your paper. Does everybody see Caesarea? That is where he is launching out from. And we are going to cover all the way to Malta if things go well this evening. Okay? So, if not, we just stretch it out a little bit, and I'm good with that. So, I, I have, to be honest, I have loved studying Acts with all of you as much as any book that we've ever studied together. I have really personally benefited from, from the study of, of this book quite a bit, really extensively. So, was it a cruise? Yes, they sure served champagne. It was all you could eat. It was... <laughs> no, it was not. It was a cruise, but it was more of a Gilligan's Island type of cruise. <laughs> then it was anything good. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and it was definitely more than a three-hour cruise, if anyone wants to sing that. By the way, the tune of Gilligan's Island 
fits to amazing grace if anybody ever wants to try it. Just think about it in your head. Now I've probably lost all my musician friends for the rest of the time. But anyway, so, all right. When it was decided that we would all sail for Italy, and now you can see where Italy is, right? You see Sicily, Italy, you see all the area. That's a long trip, right? Paul and other prisoners were handed over to the centurion Julius. Now, what we know of Julius is very little, but what we, what we think is that he was a, one of those uh, Roman centurions who would take grain and other uh, food materials over to these places throughout the islands. So he was someone who knew the way to sail a ship. He, was the, he had a knowledge of a sailor among him who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship for... Somebody shout out the name of that. Andromitium. Okay? About to sail. I don't know where you got sighted. You're a little farther. You're just always ahead of us. You're just always ahead. That's all right. That's all right, Robin. Adraminium. Uh, about, about to sail for the ports along the coast of the Providence of Asia. So you can see we're now beginning to move up towards Sidon. It's just the beginning of of the trip. Now, just a few things I want you to know. In, in Here we talk about in uh, verse 2, it talks about we put out to sea Aristarchus. Does everybody see that name? That name actually is talked about by Paul in both the book of, Corinth, of Colossians and Philemon, which means that this was a man who had been traveling with Paul most of his journey, and probably all of his journey all the way to Rome, because Colossians and Philemon were two of the last books Paul wrote before he was, he was most, uh, most understandably killed. And so Aristarchus was a man who had hung with Paul for a significant part of his ministry. Now, before we get started, what type of people do you think Paul was sailing. We learn later that it's about 276 men. What type of people are on this ship? Slaves. Slaves. Prisoners, definitely, because Paul was one of those. Soldiers, centurions, and other soldiers, definitely. Most likely Greek sailors, like who, who, because this is all around Greece. And so we don't know for sure, but most likely Greek sailors. Now, let me ask you. Did the Rome or did the Romans follow Christianity at all? What who did they follow? Zeus. Not Zeus. Zeus is the Greeks. They followed the Roman gods, right? The the pantheon of Roman gods. Now the Greeks would have followed Martin. We just said Zeus, right? Oh, they followed Martin. That's right. All of the Greeks followed Martin. They just didn't know who he was. And so that's why we are, we're very fortunate to have you part of our church. So the Greeks followed Zeus and Artemis and all these different types of gods. So the people mostly sailing with Paul, were they monotheists, meaning they believed in one God, or polytheists, which means they believed in multiple gods? <laughs> the second one, right? So they believed a multitude of gods, and the gods they believed would often play with humanity, much like a chessboard. Like, eh, I just want to have some fun with Jim. Let's see what happens if this happens. Or I want to have some fun with Candace. Let's see what that happens. They believed the gods toyed with mankind, both the Romans and Greeks. And it's interesting if you study the Romans and Greeks, they had kind of the same set of, of gods, but they just gave different names to them all the way through. Uh, to represent who they were. And again, there were also slaves, and there were also people that were far more hideous than Paul as far as being put in prison and sent to, uh, being sent to judgment. So, we move on to, to verse 3. The next day they landed in, where, Robin? Sidon. Sidon. They landed in Sidon. Does everybody see that a little farther up? They landed in Sidon, and Julius, uh, in, the kind, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might take care of his needs. What's interesting about Sidon, and you may or may not want to stick this as a little note in your Bible. If I could flip for a moment 
to Acts chapter 11. And Acts chapter 11 is when the church got persecuted heavily and started to scatter everywhere. And in chapter 11, verse 19, it says, Now those who had been scattered from the persecution in connection with Stephen. Remember, Stephen was martyred. Does everybody remember that? That caused them to, in our modern terms, freak out and say, I better you know, cut loose and get out of here. They traveled as far as the Phoenician, as Phoenicia, Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, were men from Cyprus and Cyrene and went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks, telling them of the good news of the Lord. What is interesting is when they land in Sidon, Sidon was known at this point in time to be a hub of Christian community. That the gospel had spread in such a way that Christianity had influence in Sidon. So when we read about how Paul allowed him uh, was allowed to be with his friends, what is, what is that? The message beat him there. That the message, remember, where was Paul when Stephen was being uh, slaughtered? Watching and approving. And as he was approving, it scattered people to Sidon, and in God's masterful plan, created a Christian community in which Paul, after all of his missionary journeys, would end up and get ministered to by those people. Isn't that fascinating? How God worked all of that behind the scenes? Calls, yes. How many years has passed? I don't want to, we don't know an exact number, but we can ex assume at least two decades have passed in Paul's life. Um, we don't give it, you know, it's hard because they say, and in 14 years or in three, like it doesn't give us an exact number, but it's been at least a few decades that all of this has happened to bring Paul back around to then. Does that help? Does that help, Carlos? At least give you a gauge for where we are. So, yes, yes. And he was being sent all the way to Rome. Because, and that's what Paul. So, so really, the book of Acts is not a long book, right? It's just a few decades long. But I just wanted to remind us, friends, that God is working behind the scenes and things we don't see. And as frustrating as that is, and as great as it would be to get, quote, prophetic words of what God's doing, and he does do that sometimes, it's part of being a Christian, trusting that God is working in spite or with us either way. And so God built this Christian community, and within it, Paul was able to be ministered to. And you have to think that that blessed his heart. Knowing that he was one of the ones to attack Stephen, and now this Christian community was receiving him as one that they loved. It's a great example of what the church is to be. Amen? Amen. <laughs> okay. So in verse 4, from there, now we don't know how long that they stayed there, but we know that Paul was taken care of and he was given permission because a lot of these Roman centurions knew the stories of the court, and they knew that Paul was not the same as every other prisoner, right? And so they gave him special liberties where he was under house arrest, but he was able to move throughout the community. So you notice how God set that up, right? How God allowed him to continue to minister to those around him, even though he was in this difficult circumstance. All part of God's plan that he had planned out long before to prepare it for Paul. Okay, verse 4. From there we put out to the sea again and passed the Lee of Cyprus. Does everybody see that on their map? Cyprus is to the north, slightly northwest, and they go around Cyprus. And the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Sicilia and Pamphylia, we, see, if you say these words confidently, you think I know how to say them. Okay. We landed at Myrna in Lysidia. So you see Myrna up there uh, slightly off to the, you know, as you follow the blue line around. Myrna was one of the chief ports where vessels would dock. So this was a comfortable place, a normal place for a ship to stop for a while to get reloaded. Yeah, Jim. Uh, 
we, we are going to discover, and I, I wasn't going to mention this till later, but I'll mention it now, that the season that they're doing this is the season where the uh, tides and the water were getting very difficult to navigate to the point where people would not sail past the beginning of September because that region, the water and the waves and the tumult, 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 yeah, whatever. I have smart people, you can fill that in. Uh, tumult, they, they did not sail past then. So in a sense, this whole trip was happening at the end of the season when it was safe and really more into the season when people were very hesitant to sail. So they wanted to stay close to land as much as possible, Jim. So we will find, if you look at the way they go, they kind of go from land to land to land. Like They're staying as close to the land as they possibly can because it's getting worse and worse. In fact, I even read that around the beginning of November, people would not even consider sailing because it was just so horrific and the odds of survival were so minuscule. So they were moving into that season that it was difficult and it was the safer way to go. Plus with Myrna, you had a port where you could be taken care of, they could fix anything that needs fixed, they could feed whatever need, who never needed fed and they could take care of you. But it's a great question. Yes, when they get away from the land, which was we're going to find Paul did not approve of, <laughs> that his fears were correct. So, so right now they're in Myrna, at the top there as you see it, and they're restocking everything they need to restock. And then in verse 6, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy. They were known as strong ships. They were cargo ships and put us on board. We made it, now, real quick, the centurion over them is Julius, and it's believed that he was one who regularly sailed these shores, and so he knew how to do this. He was someone, he was a professional sailor. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving at Snidius, and you'll see Snidius just a little bit to the west of Myrna. So that was a hard trip for them to make. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete, opposite Salmon. We moved across the coast with difficulty and came, and came to a place called Fair Havens near Lycidia. So you can follow the map around. You see where they were up top, and now they're moving south, southwest, down to Crete. Something fascinating that you may want to write down in your Bibles Guess who had a powerful ministry in Crete? Anybody know? You could truly impress your pastor with this one if you can guess it. What's that? You said Moses? No, Moses is wrong. You say Patrick? Did you say St. Patrick? Who lived like five, 500 years later? <laughs> I have no response to that. I have nothing. So... Timothy, great guess, but incorrect. But you're close. What comes after Timothy in the Bible? Titus. Titus. Paul had equipped, discipled, mentored Titus to go to minister in an area of, of Crete. And just so you know, this is fascinating. I just want to make sure I pull this out. Turn to it real quick. If you are going to mentor someone and hope they're successful, what type of area would you send them to? A place that needed it? A non-Christian area? So you want them to get martyred? Is that it? <laughs> Somewhere challenging? Paul, what did you say? Oh, not challenging. And so... So that they're familiar, that would be good. He didn't do that, but that, that actually would be a smart thing. What? In <laughs> New York City, okay. All right, let me read to you a little bit about Crete so you know not only where Paul land, but where he equipped Timothy to serve. I'm sorry, not Timothy, Titus. Titus to serve. It's the fourth largest island of the Mediterranean Sea. 
Uh, in New Testament times, life in Crete had sunk to such a deplorable moral level. The dishonesty, gluttony, laziness of, an, of its inhabitants were proverbial. Now, if we said a city right now in America was like Sodom, what would that mean? Wicked. Sin city. Debaucherous, right? What are some cities in America we think of as being just horrifically sinful? Not that there aren't Christian. What's that? Vegas. Vegas. All right, I've never been to Vegas, but okay. Okay, what was that? <laughs> Who's going next week? We will pray over you at the end. We bring the gospel. Bring the gospel to them. Hollywood, I think that would trump Vegas, to be quite frank. I think that would be good. That is how people viewed the people of Crete. Is that if you said that you were from there, they assumed that you were a kind of wicked, sinful, debaucherous people, even from a non-Christian perspective. In other words, if you have pagans, Romans and, and Greeks who lived at this level of morality, they believed Cretans were down here. And Paul said to Titus, I've equipped you, go. That's an interesting lesson, isn't it? And so Titus was ministering in Crete, most likely when Paul was coming through there because he had already uh, done his ministry with uh, Titus. And so when they come to Crete, you know, Paul, from what we know of Paul, is he intimidated or is he saying, oh, baby, give him to me? I want to hear that. Oh, baby, give him to me, right? He's ready to minister to some of the, the most challenged, debaucherous hearts. So you like that, oh, baby, give him to me? Yeah, that, that's, that's what we're going to pray for you over for uh, Las Vegas. <laughs> Baby, give them to me. Pray hard. Now pray hard. We will pray hard. And so uh, they went to Crete. And then Fair Havens was another good and equipped port that they were staying at. So let's move to verse 9. Oh, does anybody have any questions before we move on? Understand that this passage or this chapter of Scripture is a lot like the Israelites in reading about their travels in the Old Testament. How God was with them, but every area they went into had a new challenge. And so, in verse 9, we read, Much time had been lost, because they were stuck on Crete for a long time because of the weather. And what did I say about getting later in the season? Does it get easier or harder? Harder. harder. It gets worse. Much time had been lost, and sailing or had already become dangerous, because it was after the fast. The fast is returning to, referring to the Jewish Day of Atonement, which we know happens in late September or early October, depending on the year. So we're getting closer and closer to radically dangerous time to sail, right? So keep that in mind. So Paul warned them, men... I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss on the ship and, car and cargo and our own lives also. Now, does Paul have some experience sailing? Yes. In fact, he sailed around this area numerous times, especially, I believe it was in his second missionary journey. So he's familiar with this area. Now, did Paul have a word from the Lord or was he just speaking out of practical knowledge? What's the scripture say? Right. He stated a continued conversation with God, so we assume there's a spiritual aspect, but from what we know from the scripture, what is he speaking out of? Practical knowledge, right? And you might say, what's the difference? The difference I want to point out for us is sometimes God is not as clear as we would like him to be in situations. Yes? And right here at this point, now we, if you've read ahead, you know the Lord is going to show up in a vision and speak to Paul and it will be wonderful. But at this time in the journey, Paul is just going on his basic sea, kind of sea, 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 seaman type of knowledge saying this is really not a good idea that we should do this. It's kind of like going out in a huge hurricane saying, you know, it might not be the best time to go for a Sunday drive, Right? That's what Paul is saying. So somebody else had their hand. Shelly, or Mandy, hand up. We are familiar with Paul. We know that if you look out for something, you're going to get it. Okay. 
Right. Right. Because so he does that later. So we know that he's going to do that. So re- I'm just pointing it out that sometimes God just uses our common experience and in life to make right decisions. Right? So understand that that doesn't mean God's not involved. As Paul said, he had communion with Paul and God and Paul were communion all the time. But what we know is from Paul's simple experience, Paul comes to them. Now, let's be frank. If you're either the owner of the boat, now normally the owner of the boat was the pilot of the boat, okay? So understand, so we assume that here because that was the norm. If you're the centurion or the pilot owner of the boat, how much weight are you putting in this prisoner's understanding? Right? So it's not unusual that they would say, thank you, Paul, go have a seat, right? Then they decided not to listen to him. I only share that because sometimes as Christians, we share words of wisdom and people don't want to listen to them. Yes? Yes. Especially our kids. Amen? Yeah. (laughs) They don't want to listen to it. Or our parents. That was Shannon that said that if you're watching online. We just want to point that out. All right. And in verse 11, we read, But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul had to say, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. That's normal right? That's a normal part of life. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority uh, decided uh, that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenicia. Now you see where Phoenicia is? That's not very far, right? That's just the other side of Crete. They they weren't like having super ambitions. They were just hoping to get there, uh, hoping they could get safe and, and get to that point. And then in Crete, While a gentle, in verse 13, when a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. This is a great example of guarding ourselves against what we can see versus what we're hearing from the Lord. Paul, we believe, was hearing from the Lord. He didn't say that, but we trust in his communion. He was hearing from the Lord. He said, we probably shouldn't do this. But what they saw was a gentle wind And so what would you do if you were the captain? You sail on, right? Don't listen to that crazy Christian kook. Just sail on. All right. And so they got what they wanted and they weighed the anchor and they sailed along the shore of Crete. And as you can see on your map, they went right around east to west, rent to the very end in Phoenicia off the end of it. Uh, In verse 14, before very long, the wind of the hurricane force called the Northeaster, that's never good, right? Swept down from the island. The ship was caught in the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. So now all of a sudden, who's in control? Really God, but the elements, right? The elements are backing up what was said, that this was not a smart decision. And you know, I, I can't help but think, and, and this is a total tangent, and I get this, But you may not remember this story, but when Abraham and Lot were hanging out, remember Abraham was the uncle, Lot was the nephew, and they were looking out at two sides. of Their their people were fighting, and so Abraham said, you choose one way, I'll choose one way. And Lot looked and saw Sodom and said, oh, there's opportunity for sale. There's people. There's all kinds of business, a metropolis. That's all deserty stuff. I'll tell you what, Abraham... Because you're offering it to me, you go to the desert, I'll go to the city. Does anybody remember that in the scripture? And remember what happened? Lot ended up in the very city that was going to be consumed by fire, by God. And sometimes our own human wisdom is not what we need to look to. Now, if we feel a peace in our spirit from the Lord, we go with what he's given us. But there are times that we need to say, Lord, this may look right, but I believe you're sending me in the other direction. Because who had to come and save Lot? Abraham, right? He was living outside of the the hedonistic city of Sodom, and so God sent him back to rescue him. And it's the same type of thing going on here. Now, in verse uh, 14, 
Before long, a wind and a hurricane called the Nor'easter swept them along from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. I can't imagine. Has anybody ever been on a ship for an amazing amount, like a long amount of time where the, the, you were con seriously concerned about the weather taking great control? Yes? Yes? I've never had that experience. I know All I know is what it's like to be in the beach when you're feeling pulled out <laughs> and you're worried that you can swim back in. And so... <laughs> And so this ship is being tossed and turned to the point where these people are starting to wonder if they're going to live through it. The ship was caught in the storm and could not head to, through the wind. So he gave way to it, and they were driven along. As we were passed to the, the, the lee of the small island, can I ask, what does lee mean? Does anybody know? The What's that? The protected, side. the protected side, is that right? Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. From I'm a non-sailing person. I don't even fish, so I don't, I don't know about it. So, to the small island of Kuda, where we were hardly able to make a lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes from under the ship itself to hold it together. Now, why do you think they did that? It was falling apart, right? They were trying to use... Can you just picture in your mind for a moment? All of these men, 200, I believe it's 276 men on board, pulling and straining to keep this ship from being bashed apart in a moment. And if it's bashed apart, what happens? They drown. So the fear level must have been as intense as it possibly could be at this moment when it's happening. And this, the wind just keeps in, continues to batter and batter them. When the men had hoisted uh, the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Citrus, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along by this wind. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, the storm continued raging, and finally we gave up hope of being saved. Now this is important, because who wrote the book of Acts? No, not Paul. No, not Mark. His name rhymes with puke. Luke. Very good. I could come up with another word. It's the best I could do. Luke, smooke, smooke. So you try to come up with another word off the top of your head. It's the best I could do. All right. Luke wrote Luke Acts. It's meant to be a two-volume work he wrote to a man named Theophilus, which we studied like many, many months ago. And so when he says we, who is included in this with Paul? Luke. He's living it. He's not telling some story that Paul passed on to him many years later. He is living. He is holding those ropes to hold the ship together. He is facing the battering and the sounds of the ship, waiting for it to fall apart. At this point, I want us to take a moment and step back. What do you think Luke's feelings were at this moment? Terrified? What's, I'm sorry, Beth. I'm... <laughs> I enjoyed following Paul, but hey, <laughs> enough is enough. Yeah. <laughs> Should have listened to Paul, okay? So Luke right now, now let me ask you. Think about some of the worst times you've gone through as an individual or with a family. What are some of the emotions you felt when life was just battering and battering and battering you? Anger. That's a fair thing. So Luke may have felt anger. Not so much just at God, but just like, why is this happening? Candace, anxiety without a question, right? I mean, that, that takes it off the uh, charts, right? Like this is anxiety. This is then, right? In those moments when it goes above. Yeah. Helpless. There's a helpless, and with that can often come a hopelessness, right? And so we can't act like the people in Scripture were so far above us in what they experienced that, oh, no, they would never have felt that way. No, Luke draws a pretty dark picture at this point, doesn't he? That they had given up hope of living. Now, Luke's life was saved in Christ, so there's that. 
But as far as their life itself, Luke had given up hope that God could save them. Now, what do you think Paul was feeling at this point? Well, what, I'm having trouble hearing you. Told you. <laughs> anyway, we're going to find out he lives that out in just a moment, aren't we? You know, that sounds kind of cocky, but I, I can't argue it because in the next verses, it's pretty much what he does. So, anyone else? Yeah. At this point, that we're going to find out that the whole experience will take them up through what's called the, uh, I apologize, I'm not sure how to even pronounce this, the Ionian Sea, and even up around the Adriatic Sea, we're going to be told. Like, it is just tossing them to and fro where they don't know where they are at. Like, they're in that open area that we can see on the kind of the middle to bottom part of the left part of the map, where it says, lost in storm at sea. You see that? That, that, that doesn't mean at that point they were. It just means that whole giant area, they were just being swirled and tossed and they did not know where they were going. And that's why they end up at Malta and not even realizing it because they don't know where they're at. And we've all driven around the middle of the country and not known where we are at, right? Right. So, what's that? In the middle of the city. That can be dangerous. And so, yes. And so, let me ask you, how were the... Uh, Roman centurions feeling at this point? Stupid? Should have listened to that guy, yeah? Yeah? They may have been mocking him. I would offer they were praying to, to every one of their gods in, in, in their pantheon, wouldn't you think? Because they believe certain gods ruled over the sea. So the Greeks were praying to Poseidon. I apologize, my, my mind's not locking on the Roman God who emulates that, but whatever the Roman God of like Poseidon was, they were praying to the gods of the sea, right? That they would have mercy upon them. And so you got everyone praying to everybody at this time, praying that they somehow could possibly survive, except for the ship captain who's just going crazy trying to keep the thing afloat. Yeah. Well, we will discover that in our next verse. So it's actually a good question. Okay. Neptune. Neptune? That's right. Neptune. Thank you. Should have figured it was a planet. Yeah. <laughs> Romans got all the planet and the months. You know, like Julius is July. Augustine, Augustine is August. Yeah. So they, they got the, the row of that. So, okay. In verse 21. After the men had gone a long time without food. Now that adds to it, doesn't it? That feeling of emptiness, of lostness, of we're not going to survive. Why didn't they eat? They threw a lot of it over, but not all of it we're going to learn. Contaminates everything. Okay. Okay. And so Paul stood up before them and said, and this is where the funny part... Oh. It's humorous, but it's not humorous because these, these poor men are like frantic that they're about to die, right? And it's been multiple days like this. And he says, men, should have taken my advice. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> really, Paul? Really, Paul? You know, you had to say that? Is he wrong? No, he's not wrong. But why do you think he starts like that? And I, I have a thought, but I want to hear what you think. Why do you think he starts almost with an I told you so? Trusted him because what was that cause? It was the Lord? <laughs> yes? Bam. I think that is it. I think you touched on that too. Is, is that he wants to make the point that it is not me, but because he's about to turn this all about God, right? He's going to say, the God I worship is the one you want to know. Because again, they were calling out to all their gods, just like when Jonah was on the ship and they said, everyone cry out to your gods. Remember that, that part? That's what was going on here. And he says, uh, men, you should have listened, taken my advice and not sailed from Crete. Then you would, not have, you would have spared yourself the loss and damage. But now I urge you, and this word urge, just so you know in the Greek, 
is almost, it's like the equivalent of grabbing someone by the collar and saying, I am pleading with you with everything I can say to you. Hear me. Okay, that's the forcefulness of this Greek word, urge. And just so you know where else it's located in Romans, I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. It's that exact same Greek word that Romans 12 has for us. But now I urge you to keep up courage because not one of you will be lost only on this ship, only the ship will be destroyed. Now that had to get their attention, right? Right? Now, now is this a quiet moment in church right here? No, this is about as loud and I, I've never been on a ship like this, but I've watched movies. <laughs> and I, I've seen this kind of thing. It is loud, right? I've, I've been watching the history of pirates lately and, and just the noise of the sea and everything else and the franticness. And he says, I urge you to keep your courage. Last night, an angel of the God whom I am and whom I serve stood beside me. You see how he immediately transformed the focus onto, onto who? Onto God. He wanted to make sure they knew Paul wasn't just saying, oh, we'll be fine, right? That he had some authority. He said, stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. Now, some of you had asked earlier, was Paul scared? If God spoke to Paul this way, was Paul scared? No. He had a courage because the Lord showed up. Now, why didn't God show up early on when Paul warned the men not to sail from Crete. Faith building for who? For passengers, okay. So, see, going from A to B, you're saying that they saw that he was right. Shelly? There you go. Uh, uh, yeah, Jim? I think at this point, I'd have thrown them overboard. You'd have thrown them overboard? My goodness. He's your only hope right now. If you believe him, you didn't think that. Well, if you're, if you're a Greek or Roman, your gods aren't doing too good a job right now, right? No. But, you look at it, <laughs> but Paul's declaring that his God is about to do it. I, I hear that, but when we're in a time of ultimate despair, does a word of courage and hope go deeper within us than normal times? So I, I hear what you're saying, and there may have been some that felt that way. Like, take this lunatic and throw him overboard. We don't need this right now. I, I hear that. And there may have been some like that. But we will see here that God did not speak to Paul, obviously at least, early on. But yet later on, when God or when Paul needed the authority to speak in God's name, he was given an angel to speak in that authority, right? And so as difficult as it is sometimes in situations for us to wait on the Lord, there are times when he will speak when he knows it's best to speak to us. And I don't know about you, I don't like that. I mean, I'm not being funny, I'm being serious. I wish he would speak far more often and far more clearly than he often does. Anybody else feel that way? I know pastors aren't supposed to say that, but that's just honesty, isn't it? That's just honesty. But I do know that when we desperately need him, he will speak to us because we are his. And let's be frank, any good parent doesn't micromanage their kid and tell them absolutely every single moment of every part of their life what they should do, right? We may want to, because we hate watching them do dumb things. Amen? Amen, brother? Right. But there's a time to speak into them when they're ready to receive. I'll just share a quick illustration. My son Joel was in a game the other night, and a couple of the players from the other team who were from another area were throwing all kinds of racist and aggressive slurs at some of the teammates that, on Joel's team. And, their and as a team, they were starting to get, as you can imagine, hugely angry about it and offended by it. Parents were getting offended by it the whole time. And I kept trying to keep the team under control, saying, stay focused on what you're called to do here. 
Do not let them rattle you. And now, do you think they thought, oh, that sounds great, Coach Matt. Do you think they like that? No, they were talking about how to set up a fight afterwards in the meeting and everything else. I had to walk in between kind of as the teams were shaking hands. But it was interesting because at the end, when I got home, I read that the commissioner of our league has now banned that area of team from ever playing with Oakleaf, at least for the foreseeable future. And I was able to show my son that because you didn't lose it, because if you would have lost it and thrown a punch or started a fight, you would have been kicked out for the next game, which is the tournament coming up. And so because you held your cool and rose above it, you were able to rise above that and they had to face the penalty. Now, please, I'm all for defending people who are being attacked by others. But in that moment, that was not the right decision. So anyway, what's that? The umpires couldn't hear it because what would happen is, and I don't want to go too far into this illustration, but when they, when our players were on second base, the shortstop would walk over and call racist slurs under his breath to the players. So the, there's only two umpires at 15U, so they, they aren't able to keep track of it all. But I was stunned to see that they took from all the way from T-ball through 15U, 15 and under, all those teams from that area are now not allowed to play against our teams. We've rejected them. And so, and, and it's sad because I'm sure many of those kids are great kids, but because the coaches did not handle it, I point that out. Why am I pointing that out? The illustration fit perfect for a minute. Help me out, somebody. What, Tammy? Yeah, I lost it too. So feel free to throw out whatever you want. Sure, sure. I'm sure the whole area knew about Paul. Yeah. Yeah, it does. That's great. Yep. Yeah, that's good. And that's, and that's good. And he represented that before everybody. And so he talked about how he had an angelic vision and how God had, had spoke to him and said, you're going to testify to Caesar in Rome. And so that's where they're at. Okay, the final part of it for tonight. And God had graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. And that had to be encouraging. Because if Paul would have said, my God said, I'm going to stand in Rome. I don't know what he's going to do with the rest of you pagans. I mean, that would have been rough, right? But because of our God is a merciful God, not longing for any to perish, the scripture says, God, God had Paul say, and your lives will be preserved also because of the power of my God. Now, that's powerful, isn't it? And they may not have believed him until they were all safe on shore. And even then they may not have believed him, but I'm sure some did. I'm, you can't tell me that some people, if somebody came into my office and, and, and said, I believe in a God and he's spoken to me and this and this and this are going to happen and they seem so obscure and weird and they all happen, it's going to cause me to take notice, okay? Yeah. You take that life raft and, you're, and, you're, and you say amen and thankful for it. So it opened a door at least for Paul to minister. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that he will never, or he will happen just, I'm sorry, I'm Mr. Have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. I don't know about you, but I long for those moments when I can be so sure that God spoke that I could make that kind of statement. Don't you? How do we, this isn't like some kind of trick pastor question. It's an honest question. How do we get to that point? Yeah. Right. You would think so. At least his trust that maybe that yeah that the storms of the of what, the literal storms he was going through may have caused him to question that at that time, because we have all been in that stormy place, right? Or we may, not, we may not have said, Lord, I'm denying you, but we might have said, I'm not getting it right now, and, and this is not working for me. Josh? Yeah, 
Yeah. He's got a red light. Yep. Yep. I would hope your faith is not resting upon the lights of Florida. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and it may be building, which matters more than whether you get there a minute and a half ahead of time. And so, now you don't feel that at the moment all the time, but at least in the big picture. So, I just, yeah, okay. Yeah. They certainly would remember. And again, I, th I really feel like that, that is, for, for whatever reason, and, and I'm, not, I'm in no way belittling this, but in evangelicalism in the 90s, 80s, 90s, and even early 2000s, it was all about having an argument to defend the faith. And I believe that's important. I, want to, I can't be more clear about that, knowing what we believe. But it's far more about living a life of faith that, it, that is an example to those around us so they can see the thing we believe making a difference in the life around us. Shannon. We, which question? Oh. Right. Right, because Paul had no desire to be part of this storm. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said, hey, guys, this isn't a good idea, Right? It's not that God had spoken to him early on and said, oh, you're going to go through this storm. Everything will be okay. No, Paul was trying to get them not to go, right? Which means that God can even work in our bad decisions. Amen? amen. Can I hear a really loud amen on that? Amen. That he can work within our bad decisions because he knows deep down we're still trying to honor him with our lives. And that trumps whether we get every single thing right in the way he's walking out our lives. And I hope that's a word of comfort to some people who have been brought up that if you, you do something that's not quite along God's plan, that he says, forget you. Because that's not in anywhere in Scripture we don't see that. Good night, the Israelites said, forget you to God about 12 different times. And he kept bringing them through and bringing them through, right? And just in the same sense, in the same sense God brought Paul through. Now, I am going to ask you to hold on to your maps, stick them in your Bible, your notebook, whatever you have, because we're going to use them again next week for this final part of the shipwreck journey. Because Paul has not landed. And there's going to be 14 days from when Paul promises God will deliver them until they're delivered. Sure, I can knock out that last verse for you, Terry. In fact, why don't we just go through the rest of the book? i got an hour and a half. All right, the last verse. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Which is a good verse to remind us that God doesn't make everything wonderful, perfect, and happy and account and candy for us all the time, right? The ship would be destroyed. Everything would be destroyed. Everything you have on the ship would be destroyed. But your lives will be saved. And at that point in their, their voyage, that was good news, Right? And we're going to read that for the, from the time God spoke through Paul here, it's another two weeks that they're tossed about by the sea, grabbing onto ropes, holding the boat together until God delivers them. Because God's word comes to us, but that doesn't mean his amen comes to us in the next 10 minutes, right? And so I know that's, that's hard for us, but it's a matter of holding on to that through those time frames. And so for the next 14 days, we're going to read about what these uh, men went through as they end up on Malta. So if you happen to, I'll bring a few extra maps, but if you happen to keep it track. Does anybody have any thoughts before we close up for the night? Take 14 days? The next, I could if you would like, but no, my, my, I can't promise we'll get through Acts by next week, but that's the goal. Because the next section is kind of, we can zip through it pretty quick, but uh 
See, and I'll even finish it with the song, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I'm blind, but see, it's the exact same tune. Woo! And that is the highlight of my singing in church right there, folks. And the worst part is that's going to stick in your head for the rest of the night. So any other questions before we close up? Are we good?